UFC Fight Night Vegas 93, Perez versus Teira takes place this weekend. And I'm going to go through the entire card, starting with the early prelims, ending with the main event, giving my prediction and breakdown for every single fight on the card. Starting with the early prelim opener of Shalian Nordianbeke versus Malik Wazel Costa. I think Malik Wazel Costa is better on the feet than Shailan Nurdiembeke. And I don't think that Shailan has that dominant of a ground game to expose the ground game of Malik Wazel Costa. They're both victims of the great Steve Garcia. I'm going to go with Malik Wazel Costa because by the looks of things, maybe Shailan won't want to touch him. I don't know though. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Malik Wazel. Shailan just seems primed to be teeped over and over again in the stomach by Malik Wazel Costa with his nasty front kicks and teeps and head kicks and question mark kicks that he goes for on the feet. Very kick heavy fighter and I can see Shailan's little roadblock style of just trade hooks, ooga booga, let me go double leg now uh, type style not really working against Malik Wazel Costa so I'm going to go with Malik Wazel Costa. Um, plus, dude's got like 10 headshots. Look at his camera. Uh, Julia Palastri versus Josephine Knutson. Um, I'm going to go with Josephine Knutson, son of Knud. I'm going to go with Josephine Knutson. Knutson, the son of Knut. Um, she's actually good at fighting for, like, in women's MMA, it's like sometimes it's tricky to. To see if they're good, but um, she looks like she's good. And Julia Palastri, in her fight on the Contender Series, you know, I was looking through some of her fights. I'm thinking, okay, she's got a couple submissions. Uh, does she go for ground? Like, does she go for the takedown often? Is it something that she just imposes from the get-go? Like, when she choked out that girl in the second round on the Contender Series, did she first just ragdoll her for her entire round? No. She had to get respect on the feet first. And I don't think she's going to be getting much respect on the feet against Josephine Knutson, um, I reckon Josephine Knutson is going to win this fight by TKO in the later rounds. Um, I just don't see Julia Palastri being able to walk into the, the firing line that she needs to do. She got respect on the feet first on the contender series and then was able to get her takedown in round two. She needs to go through the fire first and this fire ain't one to go through. So I'm going to go with Josephine Knutson, way better on the feet. And I trust in her takedown defense, I guess. Maybe I'm done. We'll find out. We move on. Up the card. Jekka Sarigi versus Weston Wilson. Weston Wilson. Your ass getting knocked out by Jekka Sarig. Um, now, Jekka Sarig, you may know him from losing to the great Anshul Ghibli. Which is no shame. That guy is a future goat. So, um, you know. And to be fair, can you blame Jerka Sarig? You know what I mean? Dude, was it? Like, I don't know. I don't want to get too. Let's not get. I need to really control what I'm saying today. Because I'm in one of them ones. Jerka Sarig is a knockout artist, to say the least. Deadly. Wants to be a, a man of combat. Um... I reckon he's got enough explosive power on the feet early to really light the fuck out of Weston Wilson. Now, Weston Wilson might come out with some goofy front leg hook kick technique because, ooh, I trained with Wonderboy, therefore I should be an MMA fighter. Not how it works. Not how it works. Um, I'm going to go with Jekka Sarig. A lot of his finishes are by brutal KO. Spinning back fist on road to UFC, straight right hand before he fought Anshul Ghibli in the UFC. Since then, he's won a fight by first round TKO over Lucas Alexander as well, um, who looked good in his debut. So um, I'm going to go with uh, Jekka Sarig. If you can land the KO blows on Lucas Alexander, I know he kind of caught him when he was when he was getting back up, but um, he's got a good eye for finding KO shots. And Weston Wilson has a good chin for KO shots. So I'm going to go with... Uh, is who I'm going to go with there. We move on. Up the card. Carly Justice versus Gabriela Fernandez. Ooh, I don't know about this one. This is a tricky one. It's actually a really tricky fight to predict. Um, ooh, what do you go with? Do you go with the um, the three and one record and experience of uh, Carly Judice? Or do you go with Gabriela Fernandez for an eight and three uh, record? 
Now, this one's tough to make a decision for, I tell you. Um, holy moly, you guys. I have no idea how I'm going to do this one. How am I going to predict this fight? Ooh. Ooh, I did a bunch of research and none of it's in my brain right now. I can't remember which bitches these bitches be. You know what I'm saying? Because I've looked up a few female fights before this and now I can't remember. Um, ay, ay, ay. Um, I mean, there's no real way of knowing. Um, Carly Judis looks a little bit more feminine, but it's not saying much. So she's 25. She ain't going to have none of that anger that women over the age of 28 have, but she's going to have a lot of promise. You know what I mean? Whereas Gabriela Fernandez is 30. So she's going to be infuriated with rage. Um, trains at MMA Masters. Are we looking at a great grappling game here? Is that is that the payoff here? Is that what we're looking at? Gabriela Fernandez, are we looking at a wicked sick? You ain't got a single takedown in your career. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go with um, the other bitch, Carly Judis. We'll go with her. She's from Lafayette, Louisiana. Pretty inbred place. Poirier's from there. Um... I mean, I'm acting like there's, like, logic to this, like. Who's bigger? 5'6", six, 66 inches of reach. Carly Judice. 5'7", 68. Yeah, fuck it, we'll go with her then. We'll go with Carly Judice. She had a great war on the Contender Series. I did watch that. She went to war. Um, but... I don't know. Does that mean they're just both equally shit as each other on the contender series? Because the one that that won that fight didn't even get in, uh, didn't win her debut. Arguably should have done though. But uh, I'll go Carly Judis over Gabriela Fernandez. She arguably could have won that fight on the contender series as well, which is why I guess they've signed her, even though she lost. So yeah, I'll go with her. Fuck it. Anyway, back to Garrett Armfield versus Brady Highstand. Dude, Garrett Armfield, I reckon he's got this one in the bag. I like Brady Highstand. Brady Highstand was one of the original uh, fighters to speak out about his support of the MMA guru on Twitter. So um, I actually don't mind Brady Highstand. I'm actually rooting for him massively here over Garrett Armfield. I just don't like his game here. And I don't like his wins. And I don't like his losses. I don't like a loss to Ricky Tercios, man. I don't like a win over Fernie Garcia. It means nothing. He lost to everyone. Literally, I don't like you being fraud checked by Chad and Haliga and getting TKO'd by him in the third round. I don't like it, Brady Highstand. And that's what I don't like the most, the stand up here of Brady Highstand. I think he's good. He's big. He's rangy. He does different techniques, even if he's not too confident in him. He'll throw a front kick up the middle. I like this guy's energy. And I do think he's okay. I just think there's a massive boxing composure difference between the two of them. So I'm going to say that Brady Highstand might get some takedowns off early. But Garrett Armfield, from what we've seen in his career, can deal with being taken down quite well. And he can get back up to his feet. He's kind of like a little ball of muscle for the division. Quite short limbs, you know. Well, not too short of limbs, actually. Um, but he's got quite compact frame for the division. Um, I think he's really difficult to get a, a takedown on to keep down as well. Because he's always seeming to be able to come back up. One of those types of fighters. And uh, Garrett Armfield, in, in any, if anything, the Katona win has aged really well. Now that we know what a monster Brad Katona is. So I'm going to go with Garrett Armfield. I think they're night and day in terms of the boxing. And I think that's where the difference will be here. So maybe we see Brady Highstand get a takedown, fail a couple. You know, Armfield ends up back on his feet here and there. But Highstand is still getting some of them. Um, but then once he's back on his feet, I think we're going to see Highstand start backpedaling. Gar Garrett Armfield start pushing forward. And I think that's where the boxing difference gonna, is going to be on display. So I'm going to say second round punches TKO on the feet. For Garrett Armfield here. Um, had a real rough go of things in his debut as well. You know, a lot of people just saw him as, ah, you know, he lost to David Onama. Dude moved up to 145 on short notice. It's kind of an unfortunate circumstance for him, you know. So, um, 
yeah, I'm going to go with uh, Garrett Armfield. He seems composed. Seen him in some bad positions. Stays calm. Gets to a better position. I'll trust in that to win. We move on. Up the card. Nate Maness versus Jimmy Flick. I'm going to go with Nate Maness. I'm worried about this because Jimmy Flick has a knack for like pulling off random wins that you you didn't really think he was going to get. Um, but I am going to go with Nate Maness here. He's got a wrestling background. He can wrestle. Um, I know Umar just held him down, but I don't really know how to explain it. So I'm not even going to try. So I don't know why that. I don't know why I brought it up. I don't know why. Pretty shit, to be honest with you. He got standing guillotine by Tagiro and Bekov at flyweight. He's pretty dumb. He's a dumb guy from what we've seen in his fights so far. Like, he, he will accept to losing. Like, we saw that against Umar. He gave nothing off of his back and didn't even try and get up once. He just sort of laid there and hoped that the round would end. Um, yeah, really embarrassing stuff from him there. Really embarrassing shit. But um, Jimmy Flick isn't someone that permanently makes you lose. He'll catch you out of nowhere with something, you know, like a submission out of nowhere. So I'm going to go with Nate Maness. I think at, at 125 here, I think he'll be big enough not to be manhandled by Jimmy Flick. And I think he's got a stand-up advantage out of the two of them. And a commitment to the game advantage as well, because he is actively staying in his career and taking fights back-to-back. -back. Whereas Jimmy Flick had a moment a year ago where he said he didn't even want to do this anymore. And now he's back. So that just doesn't really seem the best. So I'm, I'm going to go with Nate Maness. I think he's a little bit more well-rounded and I think he can avoid the submissions and find a TKO, maybe. We move on. Up the card. Tagir Ulambekov versus Joshua Van. There's an idea of a Joshua Van. And then there's Joshua Van, okay? I kind of wanted to pick him, to be honest with you. I really did kind of want to pick him here over Tagir. But when you watch back for his fights, it's just... Um, as I said, there's an idea of a Joshua Van. You see him land a couple nasty body shots and you go, man, this guy's unbeatable on the feet. And then you watch back his fights and you go, oh, don't let that guy drop you. You know what I mean? Oh, please don't get wobbled by him. You know what I mean? Oh, why are you losing the first round to that guy? Oh, don't get taken down here. Not by him. Felipe Boons. Gosh darn it, Joshua Van. What are you doing? Split decision with Zalgas? Everyone who's fought Zalgas, welcome to the club. Either way, ooh, am I going to trust in finishing potential here from him? Because it seems like he builds up damage. And I don't like it when they have to build up damage when you're against a Dagestani who can just shoot and shoot and shoot takedowns over and over again with no problem when they fail those takedowns. This is the difference between Dagestanis and every other wrestler or grappler on the planet ever. And I guess they just need to go to Dagestan and learn like... You know, run up this cliff, not that cliff. And you should run with these shoes, not that shoes. And then they'd be able to fail takedowns over and over again. So I don't know what's going on over there, but they can fail fucking takedowns forever and ever. Joshua Van, though, he's just yet to really... I needed something... I needed a bit of oomph in a win that he's got. I'm not really seeing that, to be honest with you. I'm not seeing high-level opponents when he actually does get the TKO. And it's always an accumulative-based thing. And I don't like that against someone who's got the option to shoot takedowns on you as much as Tagir will. And the problem I have with this as well is Tagir and Bekov is so much taller and rangier than Joshua Van. I don't like that either. I really don't like that. 65 inches of reach for Joshua Van. 5'5". Five five. He's small for flyweight, which is insane to say, but he is. 5'7 for Tagir and Bekov. 70 inches of reach. I think that is going to be an advantage. Um... I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with Tagir and Bekov. I think there's there's a part of Tagir maybe where this is it. You know, what I mean, he's kind of the runt of the litter in the Dagestani family. And although people might be like, "What's the pressure on him for?" Like, there's no real pressure on him. There kind of is because the rest of the Dagestani's are doing well, and he's lost to Tim fucking Elliott, who did cheat in the fight, but still looked good against him defensively in the grappling. I just don't know if Joshua Van has the same wrestling instincts that Tim Elliott does, because Tim Elliott is a lifelong wrestler, like he's, he's been through that circuit of wrestling, like he's been in MMA for long enough, he knows how to scramble, his hips are always good, he's like a little bit of a gamrot, defensively, at least he was in that Tagiril and Bekov fight, um, but with Joshua Van, I just don't know if he's going to have the same instincts, and with taller opponents, this is the problem, and maybe we'll uh, talk about this a little bit in the main event as well, some of these taller framed flyweights, 
They're a lot better at getting the back. They're a lot better at getting dominant jiu-jitsu position over someone. Whereas normally at flyweight, we see a lot of scramble heavier grapplers. And, you know, the grappler might get a takedown, but the guy is always going to get back up to his feet. You know, I, I'm going to go with... Uh, I'm going to go with Tagiril and Bekov here over Joshua Van. I hope Joshua Van wins. I really hope he does, but I think it might be a situation where he's starting to do well, but it's just a little too... Not quite enough. Where, oh, he's doing it. Oh, Tagir's got him in over-unders again. You know what I mean? Oh, here we go, Joshua Van. Oh, Tagir's got fucking an underhook up against the cage. Oh, outside trip for Tagiril and Bekov. Oh, this ain't looking... Oh, he's got one hooking on the back, you lot. You know what I mean? Like, it's going to be a frustrating watch. Because we do want to see these fuckers get knocked out. But um, I think Tagiril and Bekov is probably the safer pick. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go with him over Joshua Van. As much as Joshua Van is proven, he's not proven, proven. You know, Felipe Boons, Kevin Borkas, Zalgas and Magulov split decision. I know it was in his debut, but still. Yeah. I need more. I needed more. I need like a... I need, before you go up against a Tagiril and Bekov, I need to see you like KO Alan Nascimento for hair. You know what I mean? Something like that. Or like smoke Hadley out of the water on the feet. TKO him. Not, not saying that Hadley's like a great step above some of these other flyweights that he's fought. But it's a, it's a different type of flyweight where certain ones are just there to fill up the roster, it feels like. And other ones are actually there to have some, some level of skill. So, yeah, if you would have done that and smoked someone a little better before this one, I maybe would have said, okay, you know, he's probably going to beat Tagir. But I just haven't seen that power in him yet. And I don't like trusting someone to build something up when they have to also stuff all the takedowns as well. It's just too much of an ask. So I'm going to go to Giril and Bekov. We move on. Up the card. Adam Fugit versus Josh Quinlan. Oh, I just... Oh, Jesus Christ, what are these matchups? I just don't rate Adam Fugit at all. Um, cool looking dude, but uh, I don't rate him at all. He reminds me of something. I think he looks a bit like the uh, the villain in, um, in Deadpool. You know, the one that does all the experiments on him. Looks a little bit like him. Um, he got smoked by Mike Mallet. Didn't really have any good shit there. Yes, good offensive takedowns now and again. Some good offensive grappling. We don't seem to see any fast twitch muscle fibers on him on the feet, like in terms of being able to light a dude up and and really put hands on him. So what I'm seeing is like you, he has to be like better than you to win. Like he has to be consistently better than you for 15 minutes. If he wants to win here. And I don't know if that's going to happen against Josh Quinlan. I think he could be better than him. Don't get me wrong. He could be. But Josh Quinlan's just more athletic than him. More fast twitch. Better in the grappling situations in terms of speed and strength and ability there. I don't like that he's taken this four months after his loss to Danny Barlow. But I didn't... Even though he got smoked by Danny Barlow, he took his lickings in that fight and kept getting back up and... You know, he took big shots and kept trying to grip through it. You know, it took a while to put him down in that fight. So, um, and Trey Waters is just tricky for him. Really tall and rangy guy. And Quinlan's not much of an offensive grappler. So, you're giving him someone who he doesn't really have to worry about the takedowns of. And is not really going to be a threat on the feet in terms of knocking him out. So, I think we're going to see a confident Josh Quinlan who thinks, I'll stuff the takedowns and I'll knock this guy out. So, I'm going to go with Josh Quinlan getting a TKO. Over Adam Fuji. It just seems like a no-brainer there. We move on. And he was on the source as well on the Contender Series. And they still let him in. So you got to take that into consideration. They definitely like this kid. Um, Asu Almabeyev versus Jose Johnson. Another one where an underdog pick wouldn't even be that bad. Because Jose Johnson can be tricky. Um, but this ain't no Azat Maxim. You know what I'm saying? This is the other guy. <laughs> this is Asu Almabayev. This ain't Azat Maxim coming into flyweight. This is a different, uh, a different Kyrgyzstan fighter. I think this guy's uh, flag is yeah Kazakhstan fighter. Um, I'm gonna go with him to win. His grappling has been good so far. Hasn't really let him down yet. He dominated Ode Osborne, choked him out. CJ Vergara, um, similar. You know, I mean, it's just I, I just don't. I don't see... Her. Jose Johnson has been held down and taken down by people a lot worse. And I don't like that. That really worries me a little bit because a lot worse. I mean a lot worse there as well. You know, Jose Johnson got taken down by Jack Cartwright, who was actually a bit of a grappler for an English fighter, which is pretty rare. But he actually was a guy with a wrestling background. 
Um, so he did, you know, he got held down by him, but he was so tall that he would sort of spin his way up and threaten a submission and then use it to get on top position or something like that. But, you know, Chad Anhaliga was able to get him down four times in their fight not trying too many of the times, and he spent quite a bit of time on top position. And I'm thinking, you know, if someone better than them, who's likely got better grappling than them in Azat Mac, uh, no, sorry. Um, Asu Almabayev. If he, uh, if he gets him down, I reckon he'll be able to keep him there. That's the problem. But Jose Johnson, one of the biggest weight bullies we have, you know, big for bat. I don't know how he's going to make flyweight. He's going to die. How is he going to make flyweight? This is a 125 pound fight. This guy is massive for flyweight. How tall is he at flyweight again? Six foot. Right. This dude's going to fucking die out there. If, unless anorexia is the new best base for MMA, yeah. This malnourished prepubescent boy is getting tossed around like a bitch out there. And he might snap as he hits the canvas. Frail ass little malnourished bitch. So I'm going to go with Asu Malmabayev. Unless, unless malnourishment is the best base for MMA. You let me know. Um, but yeah, Jose Johnson shouldn't win this one. He's massive though. But I am going to go with Asu Malmabayev. And again, Chad Anhaliga is arguably a flyweight himself. And he was still able to get takedowns and get control time and make it a bit of a fight. So I'm going to go with Asu Malmabayev. We move on. Up the card, Miles Johns versus Douglas Silva de Andrade. Ooh. Yeah, we'll go Douglas Silva de Andrade. Do you think Miles Johns is going to KO Douglas Silva de Andrade? That's the question with this one, right? Do you think he's going to KO him? Is that what's going to happen here? When he couldn't KO Cody Gibson, how shit Gibson looked in that fight needs to be mentioned as well. He does have some decision wins. But I'd need him to win this by a TKO if I want him to win this, right? I don't see him out grappling Douglas Silva de Andrade. I don't see him TKOing him. At bantamweight, I think Douglas is going to be a little harder to manipulate. You know, he's had some fights up at featherweight before. You know, he fought Lerone Murphy to a decision. Quite competitive. Made Lerone look like a guy who I didn't think could beat Edson Barboza. So that's saying something. Um... Yeah, Miles Johns, just a little bit too reliant on overhands and power shots and massive overhands and dipping your head and throwing it over the top. And I just feel like we're going to see Douglas Silva de Andrade make reads on that and, and find his find his way into this fight, you know. Uh, Douglas Silva de Andrade coming up win over Cody Stamen, Sergei Morozov. These are, these are more appropriate wins that I care a little more about. The Said Namagomedov fight was very competitive as well. That needs to be mentioned. And so was the Murphy one. So, yeah. I'm going to go with Douglas Silva de Andrade. Was not impressed by Johns' performance against Cody Gibson. And I know I picked Cody Gibson to win. But I thought Cody Gibson could throw something that could hurt another man. And he can't, unfortunately. Um, but Miles Johns still looked shit against him. Like Gibson looked like a frail old bitch out there. And Johns was still like on the back foot nervous about swinging. So I'm going to go Douglas Silva de Andrade. Johns just seems a little too basic for a Bantam weight to succeed with. We move on. Up the card. Lucas Almeida versus Timmy Kuamba. You know what? I'm half tempted to go Lucas Almeida here, you know, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go with Timmy Kuamba. They've got him listed as a lightweight. He's not a lightweight. He stepped up on short notice in his debut to fight um, Bolagioki, who everyone was picking. And to be fair, took him to a split decision. I thought he lost a fight pretty clear. Um, two rounds to one, but took him to a split decision. Very close competitive fight. I thought he was getting hit by the better shots. Especially, I mean, I remember Oki was jabbing him up at one point in the first round, especially just constantly jabbing him in the face. Um, but he looked quite composed. And he does have good finishes in his career. Um, and he's got a few of them. They're not really against the best of opponents, but he fought Matteo Vogel, who was a good regional level guy at one point in his career. Canadian guy, though, unfortunately for him. So couldn't quite make it to the UFC. But he's coming off a win now. Um, but he actually, at one you know, he fought the who's who. You know, he fought Damon Blackshear as he came up. He fought Serhi Sidi on the come up and has a win over him. He's got a win over Garrett Armfield. Um, and he lost to Timmy Kuamba and got beaten by him. So I feel like this guy was actually a decent regional test for a lot of these guys that were coming up. Um, so I'm going to go with Timmy Kuamba. I think he's he's been tested. 
There's been some tough fights for him. He showed up in his debut, upper weight class, a week after fighting at 145 as well. So there's no way he would have been in any way like, oh, it was upper weight class, but he was out of camp. So he had a lot of weight on him. Like, no, he was very small out there compared to Oki. And um, I'm going to go with him over Lucas Almeida because Lucas Almeida, just all of his wins are like, there's an asterisk behind them that I notice. You know what I mean? He's First of all, he's 33 years of age. Probably been doing a lot more coaching than fighting recently as well. It seems to happen when a lot of guys start going 50-50 in their UFC career. They start showing up in a lot more corners of teammates. Something I've noticed. Um, lost to Pat Sabatini. Tough look. Andre Philly lost him by KO in the first. That's a tough look. Now, I understand if you lost to Andre Philly and he out-gritted you in a decision victory, 29-28. Little different now. Losing to him by first round TKO is crazy. Um, beating Trezano during like a both of you guys knock each other down non-stop type fight is also kind of embarrassing. Um, now, I know that Michael Trezano beat um, Ludovic Klein, who just beat Moises. <laughs> but you got to understand, guys, this sport makes no fucking sense. So I'm going to go against Lucas Almeida here. He does have some decent wins. But I think an educated striker that don't get too crazy on him is going to be able to get this one done. And I think Timmy Kwamba going up against Oki in his last fight has probably been good for him as well because, you know, he's fought a larger guy with some imposing uh, physicality out there, which is what Lucas Almeida relies on quite a bit, who, like, can knock you out. Like, he was a larger opponent with a lot more power than than uh, Timmy Kuamba, and Timmy Kuamba survived against him three straight rounds, made it a split decision, and kind of, in all honesty, ruined the hype of Balagioki, because Balagioki had quite a bit of hype behind him coming in, like, people are like, this guy's going to be a problem, he's going to, oh, split decision, kind of yucky, you know what I mean, so, I'm going to go with Timmy Kuamba, he kind of spoiled the layup of Oki. So I'm going to go with Timmy Kuamba winning this fight by decision. We move on. Ikram Aliskarov versus Antonio Tricoli. I'm going to go with Ikram Aliskarov, of course. Um, it's kind of weird how they literally went from giving this guy top five opponents to, okay, here's, here's this guy. Um, who's all right at fighting, don't get me wrong. He's actually pretty good. He's got a few wins in a row against some can 21 and 13 opponent you take into a fucking decision. Two and six, Fabio Mejia, who's now two and eight, who's 36 years of age. You're taking him to a decision. Are you mad? Are you fucking sick in the head or some shit? Finish him. You're getting given layups. Who is this guy? Why is he getting these layups? Lost to Diego Lima. A chinny fuck. This guy has got zero finishing potential outside of submissions. You ain't submitting a Kramaliskarov. And you ain't knocking him out either at all if you can't KO. Absolute schmucks. So... Fucking best of luck to you, mate. It ain't gonna be, it ain't gonna be good. I think Ikram Aliskarov, if he's as good as we think he is, should smoke this guy in about a round or two. Um, I'm gonna go with Ikram Aliskarov inside the distance, first or second round finish. Don't know which one it'll be. Maybe he'll try and go for the grappling heavy style because you know Tricoli is an imposing figure out there. He's a big dude, big phys uh, physical guy. Looks yoked as fuck. So there might be some hesitance for Ikram to trade on the feet, but I think he can. I think he can, you know, like, um, I don't see anything that Tricoli does well. I don't know what, he's 33, like, am I missing something? What is, what is that, why is this guy signed? Why did he get on the contender series in the first place after going 0-3 against any test they gave him? And then beating two absolute schmucks by decision. They got him on the contender series for that. Let me find this guy's fucking Instagram page. Is he fucking famous or some shit? Like, 6'5", good beard lineup, decent hairline. I mean, I know, but like, there must be something else. Antonio Tricoli. I'm confused as to why this guy was signed in the first place, and now I'm confused even more. Seeing him back in the UFC after doing fuck all nothing as well, like. I mean, I can't find this guy. I don't, this guy's not famous, so I don't know why they're fucking signing this absolute schmuck. Like, if I'm the UFC scouting agent, I'm seeing this guy's regional career and I'm going, fraud. Why would we sign him? Absolute fraud. Lost three in a row to schmucks that he should have fucked up and then went to fight absolute bums and still made it look difficult. So, 
Yeah, I'm going to go against him. I'm going with Ikram Aliskarov. We move on. Up the card. Alex Perez versus Tatsuro Teira. Ah, this is a tricky one, guys. I don't know who I'm picking. I've done my research. Watched all their fights. I just don't know what to go with. My thought process is, it seems a little too perfect for Teira to win. They just signed Kai Asakura. Got a bunch of hype around it from Japan now. The UFC this is. So they, now they've got the main event this weekend of Tatsuro Teira. Looking to kick the doors in for Japan. If he wins, they can put him against a top-ranked opponent at flyweight. Perez has got good takedown defense against Makayev. But man, am I... Dude, Makayev just might be shit. Yeah, I, I don't understand how Makayev wins. Like, I thought flyweights were skilled fighters, but I think we're in a Pantoja Makayev era where you just the shitter you look, the better you are. I guess like it's literally all physicality now. Um, but Perez was like coming off all these losses when he went in there against Makayev, so maybe that was he was kind of holding back a little bit, like he. What maybe if he has confidence, he'll go a bit harder after stuff in a few takedowns. Because it did look like he was holding back. He looked like he could have been exposing Makayev's shit stand-up, which is awful. I'd say Teira's got better stand-up than Makayev. I'd say that. But Perez with momentum and activity, he might be like, I'm back. I'm the Alex Perez that I was. You know, I'm not this guy that just keeps fucking going out there and fumbling these wins in the first round. Just smoked Nicolau, but Nicolau is chinny as fuck, so it's kind of difficult to say if he's going to smoke Teira. I don't, I don't think it's wise to say that. But then again, Teira really struggled with Edgar Chérez, you know. I was, I've, you know, I've watched back a lot of his fights. A lot of his fights. I've watched back fights of Teira when he's not even fighting, because I'm interested in him as a prospect. Because I want to see a Jap Japanese fighter. Chérez made him look... But then again, Mikhaev is shit, and he looks shit against everyone ever. So it's kind of... Carlos Hernandez, he smoked. He controlled him in the first round. He caught him with a straight right, and then a left hook and finished him off. Jesus Aguilar gave him some trouble early, like came out guns blazing, and then jumped to guillotine, and then Taylor escaped it and triangle armbarred him in the first round. CJ Vergara um, did well like defensively. In the grappling, but just kept giving up too many positions. But you kept reversing some, like he would buck out of being mounted. This is what I don't like about Taylor, is he does go for mount quite a bit. And mount at flyweight is asking to be reversed, because people just seem to be able to arm and Sarukian their way out of it. They've got really weird hip strength at flyweight. I guess it's just part of being a very light person in general, but especially with short limbs. But um, Carlos Candelario took him down in their fight. But am I going to say that Perez has shown no weakness? Like, Perez has shown a bunch of weakness in his career as well. Do I think Tatsuro Teira is going to finish Perez? That's the question, right? Can I see Tatsuro Teira finishing Perez? How shit is Mohamed Makayev? These are the questions that are rattling around in my brain right now. Is Makayev just that shit at grappling? But he's just got this ability to shoot them non-stop without like ever getting tired uh, five rounder i don't think taylor is the type of guy to shoot as much as makayev he's probably going to shoot better than makayev he's got the frame to tangle things up i know they probably got perez as an underdog i'm not even going to check the odds i bet you they've got him as an underdog um Oh, it's a fucking tricky one, man. It's a really tricky one. Perez, when he has been put in bad positions by jiu-jitsu guys, he does fucking crumble. Like, against Pantoja, he got put in a rear naked choke, back take early, got subbed. I mean, I wouldn't say it's a weakness in his game, though. Like, it's not like a every time when you really look at it. I'm just thinking of the Pantoja fight and the, the guillotine from Figueredo, but in reality... He was doing all right in the grappling exchange against Figueredo until the guillotine, which is why Figueredo pulled the guillotine. But he did get guillotined, so. Joseph Benavidez beat him up with back of the head shots. I remember that fight. Fought some good opponents since then. Fought some decent grapplers. Eric Shelton's not, not bad as a wrestler. He had a wrestling background. Beat him. Hussier Formiga's no joke in the grappling, especially. He took him out with low kicks. 
I just, when I watched him against Mikhaev, this is my thing. When I watched him against Mikhaev, if Tara got to certain positions, he could take the back from there. Mikhaev won't take the back. He's not good at jiu-jitsu. Like, he's not good. Like, he just does it. I don't know how to explain Mikhaev's style sometimes. It really does confuse me. He's a true... Uh, he really chucks a spanner in the works to anyone that says, like, it takes skill to be champ. It's... it's... When, I, when I watched Perez against Mikhaev and I watched him stuff a few takedowns, when he then tried to strike, he was so unbelievably open and so slow and overthinking of things and didn't really let his hands go the way he needed to. And I know that, you know, anytime he closes distance, he knew Mikhaev would just shoot for a takedown because he is bitch made. But I feel like Taylor is more opportunistic. He'll find a body lock position and then drag out a leg and, and, and take you down from there. Or he'll get onto the back and then kick off the cage and drag you down to the canvas with him. And he's got really good reversals if he ends up on bottom. Like he's really good at cradling and rolling his opponent on to, on, onto bottom position and ending up on top. So I am going to go with Tatsuro Teira. And you know what? I'm actually going to take him by TKO. I think he'll get a, a round of grappling off. I think he'll get a second round of some success. Perez might get back up and then, all oh, Perez is coming forward. Oh, wait, Taylor's caught him. That's what I think is going to happen here. I think Taylor is way better looking technically on the feet than Mikhaev. I think he's he's better as, like athletically than Mikhaev as well. I would say that. Almost said aesthetically there. I'm not trying to say anything. No Jones. Um, athletically, I think he's better than Mikhaev. I think he's a little bit faster. Looks more comfortable in what he does. Mikhaev hesitates on every punch, overthrows certain punches, just does the combo when the opponent's not even in front of him. He does so, so he's better than Mikhaev frame, reach, distance, distance management, striking. But but the grappling is the question, right? I, I think he's better than Mikhaev. Like if I were to put Tatsuro Teira against Malcolm Gordon. We don't need to clutch no third round sub. You know what I mean? That's that's how I'm seeing this. If I was to put Satsuro Teira against even Jafel Filho, I don't think we're clutching a third round sub. I don't think he has to escape a leg lock. Against Tim Elliott in the grappling, I think he could get Elliott's back. I don't think he'd have to, you know, illegally knee guilt trip Elliott into not having not throwing anything and I reckon he could keep a dominant position over Charles Johnson. You know? I'm, I'm going to have to side with Tatsuro Teira. I think I was going to go Perez a little. I was hinting towards it, maybe. It's a tricky matchup for Teira. Um, but I think he'll do this. I think he'll rise to the occasion. That's something else you've got to uh, think about as well, isn't it? 24 years of age. Uh, two, year two, he's born in the year 2000. Jesus Christ. Okay, yeah, I am old. Um, wow, that's weird to see. Uh, 24... Born in the year 2000. Oh, God. I'll be 30 soon. Um, yeah. Judging, I'm going to trust in the improvement. He had more notice for this fight than any of the other guys. You know, they were doing that him versus Van thing and him versus Perez now and all of this. And it got mumble jumbled. He was supposed to fight Tim Elliott first in May and it got canceled. And then they put together the Van fight. And that got scrapped, and now they've put together this. So he's had more notice than any of them, like by a month, three weeks or so, if anything. And they've known they've probably wanted to put him in a good spot on a card. They know they knew they were going to sign Kai Asakura. I reckon he'll take advantage of this situation, and he'll win. I reckon he'll find it. He'll either find a submission early or a TKO. And you know what? I'll take a TKO. I'll take him de doing well in the grappling enough to make Perez hesitate. And then Perez starts forcing punches, trying to move forward on him. Because Teira moves back really well. And he also has a really good right hand. Right off the shoulder. Let's it fly right over the top. I could see him catching Perez over a lead hook or some shit. So we'll go with that. I'm going to go with Tatsuro Teira. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Toodle Pip, I'll see you later. And goodbye. If he wins this, if Teira wins this, there's a massive fan base waiting for him. And they will definitely go to Tokyo at the end of the year if he does. But yeah, you just got to consider that Taylor is young, will improve. I'm not going to make the state mistake of saying that Taylor is going to be the exact same fighter that just showed up, who looked great and had his best performance, right?
Like, he's actually improved in performances as he's gone on in his career. Outside of the Edgar Sheares fight, that Hernandez fight was the best he's ever looked. So I'm going to I'm gonna trust that he's making improvements. So, yeah. And plus, he just started getting money. Broke before. Got some money in. When you get that money in as a young prospect, that's enough to take your weight cut from a nutritionist helped weight cut to just a regular weight cut. So I like that. I like when they get over that initial hump of a few fights, couple bonuses. I can afford a nutritionist. I can afford this during a training camp. I can afford this guy to help me out my strength and conditioning. That That's going to make the change. So I'm going to go with him. You know, we've seen Perez. He's got the money. He's been in big fights. He's had his chance. No fucking improvements seen. So I'm going to go with Tara. See you later. Thank you for watching. Toodle Pip. Goodbye.